Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. I want to start by just saying thank you. It is not a light thing to give up a bulk of time on a Saturday. So thank you for your willingness to give your time and give your presence and share in a conversation this morning. So I don't take that lightly. My wife and daughter are running errands with theater practice. And we have one cat that's in a cone of shame because he has an allergy spot. So life goes on. That's one thing that life will do. It will go on. So thank you. Thank you for being here. So I'm gonna share my screen with you, but before I do, I wanna just lay out briefly what we're going to look at. We'll have two sessions, one this morning for about 45 minutes, and I'm setting a timer where I don't get too long-winded. So I'm setting that. So we'll have one this morning, and then we'll have a lunch break, and then we'll come back and have one in the afternoon as well. But I hope that, just know, like Maggie said, that we're going to um, record this. So if, if it goes a little fast at times, if it goes a little slowly at times, if there's a lot of info, don't be anxious about it. Just soak up, soak up what sticks to you, and then you can always go back if you want to dive in more deeply, and you can follow up as well. So just relax as much as you can, and I hope we have a chance to have some conversation together as well. So I'm going to share my screen. So the great thing about Zoom is that it lets you do this. The bad thing about Zoom is that we're not actually in the same room with each other. So we'll try to do as best as we can, and then uh, we will follow up. So this morning, we're gonna look at this theme of the path of illumination. This is an ongoing theme that's really meant a lot to me, um, especially during the past two years. I took this COVID time really as almost an intensive retreat space to really look and see what particular focus points that I thought the Spirit was inviting me to look at and my parish as well and people who I'm in touch with. And this was a major point of this to look at the image of the transfiguration and what it can actually teach us about light and about how we share in that light, how we participate in it. So that's what I hope to do this morning is to spend some time sharing some thoughts with you and then see what questions and thoughts that you might have. So I'm gonna start with this particular slide. This is an icon of the Desert Fathers and there's this wonderful story where Abba Lot came to, Ab to Abba Joseph and said, Father, according as I am able, I keep my little rule and my little fast, my prayer, meditation, and, and contemplative silence. And according as I am able, I strive to cleanse my heart of thoughts. Now, what more should I do? The elder rose up in reply and stretched out his hands to heaven, and his fingers became like ten lamps of fire. And he said, why not become fire? I've always loved that story since I ran into it at first in um, Roberta Bondi's book. When I was a, ho a hospital chaplain, they had a copy of that. And I ran into it and have loved it ever since then. But this image of why not become fire is an important one for us to consider. So the layout of the day, I want to look with you around how the transfiguration describes the disciples' encounter with the uncreated light. And then some questions. How do I understand my own participation in this light? And how does this wisdom describe my own deepest identity with spaciousness and awareness? So the first section will look at key themes of the transfiguration with art. And with session two, we'll look at how the wisdom of the transfiguration offers a lens through 
through which we understand our own deepest essence and connection with all of creation. This is a traditional icon, I bet you've all seen it. It's from Theophan the Greek. It's a 14th century icon that, that Theophan drew. It's a really well-known image with the figure of Christ in the middle, flanked, of course, by Moses and Elijah and the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, beneath that in different postures and poses in their state of being shocked and overwhelmed. So there's a song that I want to start with, actually. It's an Orthodox hymn called the Foss Hilleron, O Gracious or O Gladsome Light, as we look at this encounter that we have. And this is the earliest known Christian hymn still in use today. And it's been translated and put in different contexts and different um, denominational prayer books. But the words, O Gladsome Light, O Grace of God the Father's Face, eternal splendor wearing, celestial, holy, blessed, our Savior Jesus Christ, joyful in thine appearing. To thee a right belongs all praise of holy songs, O Son of God, life giver. Thee, therefore, O Most High, the world does glorify and shall exalt forever. So we see from the earliest days of the Christian community, there's been this deep reflection on the light, the light of God, the light of Christ, and how we're called to actually participate in that. So this is a particular setting from St. Vladimir's seminary that will get us more into the mood. <laughs> So two key points to help you know where kind of I'm coming from with this. About six months into the pandemic, i had been spending time meditating with the image of the transfiguration and also doing work I would add with uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, looking at Tibetan studies as well. That's long been an interest of mine. And one morning I woke early and was not quite awake. And I had a dream or a thought around this image. And there were two points. One was that the light came from within. And the second was that the truth of the transfiguration is not just about Jesus. It is about me. It is about you. It's about each one of us. And those two points have continued to frame so much of how I engage with this. So the text itself is very familiar to us. There are three different versions of it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have a version. And so I'm going to read this 
briefly, and then there's a note at the bottom about slight differences or additions in Matthew and Mark's version. It says, now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was still praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed away, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. So when we look at this familiar story, we see key moments and themes. The first is there's a moving away. There's a retreat to another place. There's a leaving of routines. And then we have Jesus' transfiguration and the disciples encounter the uncreated life. Peter asserts his own desire, his own ego at grasping asserts itself in his urge to control. And the cloud envelops them as a reminder of the limits of the egoic or rational grasping. And the voice calls them to listen. They have an experience of the compassion of God and their heart is transformed. And then Jesus is found alone. They return, but they are transformed by the experience. And so we see the value of silence. That there's a needing time to let this experience soak in. So these key moments, I think, are important when we look at the story of the transfiguration, because if, when we approach it this way, we can see how we can, we can identify with this movement within ourselves. That this really, this is how the story comes to life, if you will, that we, we can see different aspects of our own life, different moments in our life, and also where resistance in our own life might assert itself as well. That's always something to pay attention to. So you might are already notice in yourself which one of those moments, if you will, or if there's another part of the story as well that really resonates with you. So I wanna show this encounter depicted in art and how art and Iconography actually gives us a lens that we can unpack this and actually experience this story in a powerful way. But I want to start by going back and look at two other icons. The first is the Annunciation and the second is the, is the Baptism. So what I'd like you to do is just to spend a few moments looking at these two icons. They're very familiar scenes. On the left, we have Gabriel coming to the Blessed Mother to announce to her what is to come to pass, and Mary's own willingness, her fiat, to participate, to embody that. Notice, if you can, where the light is in that icon, where the light is, where the light of God, if you will, is, how it's depicted. There's a little, almost a laser beam of divine glory that is zooming in to a light on Mary. Now look in the baptism. This is a well-known story as well. Jesus going to the river to be baptized by John, his cousin. Notice in this one as well where the light is, how it's depicted. 
it's a larger laser beam, but it's still, it's light coming from somewhere. And you see this, it's almost like at that, that wonderful image that the heavens were ripped open, that apocalyptic version that's so pronounced in Mark's gospel. And the light shoots in and you see right in the middle of the light, the dove. Here's another icon of the Annunciation, a painting this time, 15th century. And you also notice as well the light and the dove coming in to land on Mary. Everyone seems so peaceful. I know in all of these, when you flip through so many of these, it all seems so peaceful. It really doesn't capture the enormity of what actually was happening at that moment. Here's another one, Henry Asawa Tanner, if you've not heard of him, an African-American painter. This was from 1898. This is one of my favorites, if you've never seen this one, of the Annunciation, this encounter that Mary has with light and being called to share in the light. Here's another version of the baptism of Jesus where we look at the light and the placement of it. This is Adele Verrocchio. Leonardo da Vinci actually finished parts of this painting himself, mainly the angels. People think that da Vinci painted the angels. But you can notice in this as well the placement of the light and how it's coming in. This is El Greco's version. 16th century. There's a lot going on in these two. But you see the same theme, the one on the left, this light pours down from the image of God, the creator at the top, pouring all the way down through the spirit. Then you have John holding the shell. You have lots of symbolism with colors in these as well, with red. And on the right as well, a slightly different version that El Greco did where you have this apocalyptic image of the heavens ripping open and the light coming in. Now notice what happens in the icon of the transfiguration. Something curious takes place. The light, the laser beam of the Annunciation the apocalyptic ripping open of the heavens and the light pouring down. But when you get to the transfiguration, this is in a uh, uh, magnification of the Theophan's icon. The light, the location of the light has shifted. It is coming from Christ, not pouring on Christ. It's emanating from Christ. And I think this is very important when we reflect on the deeper wisdom of what the transfiguration actually teaches us and how we participate in it, is that the origin, the direction, or the location of the light has shifted. So this helps prime us up, because here's in another. I'm going to come back to this one later. It's a wonderful abstract version of the transfiguration by Lewis Bowman. So these two broad themes, the light came from within, and the transfiguration is not only about Jesus, it is about our own deepest identity. So these questions that this wisdom challenges us to reflect on is what effect does this have on our understanding of ourselves? And how does such an awareness of the indwelling light transform our theological anthropology? That is the way we understand ourselves within and through the lens of God's presence, our, the, our theological anthropology. Now, a little bit of theology. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, there's a long-standing framework for understanding the uncreated light, which is exemplified on Mount Tabor in this particular story. So the question that the, that the church has 
reflected on for two millennia really is was the light a created expression or was the light a manifestation of God's energy and therefore divine? Eastern Orthodoxy states and the Western mystical tradition resonates with this that the uncreated light is God's energy and is therefore divine. We do not, cannot understand God's essence. However, we do encounter and participate in and share in God's energy. Therefore, we participate in divinity itself, God's own life. So we understand this called the share in the divine nature and the divine life as theosis, the process or the experience of deification. And this lies at the heart, you might say, of an orthodox theological anthropology. And we see this wonderfully rich trail of images and reflections throughout Christian tradition. We see it in St. Athanasius, this image of God became man so that man might become God. Irenaeus as well picks this up. That is, there's a sharing in God's energy so that the degree of participation nurtures this awareness of our own deepest identity. Second Peter pull, pulls this up and says, we are called to be partakers of the divine nature. In 1 John, we hear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So we have this strong current within our own texts around how we're called to participate in the life of God, in the light of God. A crucial figure in this was St. Gregory Palamas. Palamas was a 14th century crucial fig figure in Byzantine Orthodox thought. He wrote a wonderful set of um, reflection called the triads, and this is an excerpt from that. It says, the light is thus divine and saints rightly call it divinity because it is the source of deification. Therefore, deification or communion between divinity and humanity does not imply a confusion of essences or natures. It remains nevertheless real communion between the uncreated and his creature and real deification, not by essence, but by energy. I think that's a powerful quote. An important point is that this is through God's energy, not essence. So we, in theological terms, we retain God's otherness. The otherness, the transcendence of God is not about distance but it's about, about God's otherness. And so we retain this essence of God and say that God, God's essence is unfathomable. And at the same time, God's eminence, we participate in that light and we embody that light within ourselves. So he reflects on St. Paul and the road to Damascus, which was another encounter with light that we remember. It says, but in attaining this condition, the divine Paul could not participate absolutely in the divine essence, for the essence of God goes beyond even non-being by reason of transcendence. So there's in what we call an apophatic element that is retained, that we're unable to describe or encounter God's essence. We speak of what God essentially is not while we share in God's energy. And this is why I think that this icon of the transfiguration is so important for us because it, it lets us see, it gives us a glimpse that we can imagine what this participation actually looks like. So when we were at Snowmass, we had a conversation with Father Thomas, one day, there was a small group of us, about four or five of us, who went to visit him in the periodical room, and he was tired, but we had an hour and a half to just sit and bounce things off of him, 
And each of us had brought little notes of what we were all working on. And he was sitting there and he would stare out the window at the mountains. And he started telling us his own thoughts that he was continuing to work on around how we're called to participate in this divine nature. And he told us, he said, at some point, there is not numerically one, but there is a realization that there is no separation between us and God. So he said, you don't collapse it down to say that there's numerically one, and you also claim that there's no separation. So there's a distinction, but not a separation between us and God. And the, I did the only thing I could do. It came out before I even thought about it. I laughed. I started to giggle. And he looked over and he giggled and said, what was so funny? And I said, well, that's a lot to live up to. And he put his hands together like he would do. And he looked and he laughed and he said, but that's the thing. It's not something that you live up to at all. It's something that you actually die to. And he said, that is the ultimate call of what Christian practice is, that we die to this sense of a separate self, to that egoic grasping that we see in the figure of Peter in the text, of course. We see that. We die to that sense of self, and we're overshadowed by the presence of God that reminds us of who we are and what lies at the heart of our own being. So for me, I've come to see the transfiguration as an iconic visualization, that it is a visualization of our own personal vocation and an experience of an expanded awareness of and participation in the divine life. So we ask ourselves, how can we visualize ourselves within the mystery that this image points to? How does this deeper wisdom of this truth inform our self-awareness? And to me, more and more, I'll tell you, and this has an enormous influence from the um, Vajrayana teachings, of course, that visualization has become a very key piece of my own practice to say, how do we visualize what is the essence, the truth of our own life and how we're sharing in the divine life? So I want to open it up at this point, and this gives us some time. I want to open it up, and that's an intro piece to kind of get us primed up around some really central questions. And then just to let you know where we're going to go, because that's a lot of info to just throw out there at you. Where we're going to go after lunch is to take some further steps and actually look at how some interfaith dialogue offers us some language and some images that helps us under, understand this even more. And kind of, to me, what it's done is cracked open my own sense of what Christian practice can look like. And it's expanded that more. So after lunch, that's where we're going to go. We're going to do a deep dive. But I want to offer plenty of time where we can have a conversation together and just spend some time reflecting with each other. So there's different ways to do this. And Maggie, what thoughts do you have on what might be the best way to do it? Well, we were originally thinking of having um, breakout groups where Perfect. we could talk about this for a little bit and then come back to a large group, bring back um, the reflections we found in the breakout groups to you. So That's wonderful. Maybe Perfect. Uh, 15 minutes for a breakout group. That's perfect. 15, 20 minutes even. Okay. All right, I'll set it for 18 minutes. How about that? So this will take a few minutes.
Okay, so you will be asked to join and when it when it props up on your screen join and then one minute you'll get be given a one minute warning at the end. So here we go. So if you have a question for Father Stewart, you want to raise your hand and then uh, keep yourself muted until we ask you to uh, speak. Yeah, anything that anyone thought of. Maggie, I'm going to bring everybody back. They're still waiting in their breakout room. So let's wait a minute. It gives them 60 seconds and then it will send them back. You so if you have anything that you want to share, just wave your hand really big like this and we will we will see it. <laughs> Isn't technology great and wonderful and frustrating and wonderful? <laughs> All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> While someone waits to, let me scan over because they're on two pages. While someone waits to raise their hand, here's another thought that came to me that I took out of the original layout for this morning was there's another, there's so many pieces of this story to like just to dig into and spend time with. And another one is the whole dynamic of being overshadowed is a recurring theme that we find in text, we find in stories. The, the, this story of the transfiguration has so many connections with Moses on Mount Sinai, of course. Um, there's so many connections there and themes of being overshadowed. And of course, what's the other story that we think of with someone being over, overshadowed? It connects back with the um, Annunciation itself. Mm -hmm. And so you see how these images and kind of the, you know, energy in them and the wisdom in them connect back with each other and they loop back on themselves. Um, but that's, that's another space that you could, you could spend a lot of time, you know, sitting with. Um, like, what does it mean to be overshadowed? And one thing that I've spent some time looking at was, is there a difference between being overshadowed and overpowered? I think so. I think there is. And I think the dynamic that we have in sharing in, in God's own life is one of being overshadowed, but not overpowered. And I think that's an important piece to say that our participation, we're called to participate and so then, you know, that's how it loops back around and the image and the icon of Mary of the Blessed Mother becomes who we are in our own deepest self, that we carry the light, we give birth to the light, all of those pieces. So the story and the wisdom of the transfiguration also is deeply connected with Advent. Just might not look on look like it on the surface, but when you start to spend time with it, everything starts to just bubble up, and you see. So all of those themes. So if anyone has anything they want to share, just wave your hand really, really big. Lynn. And then Kay, Kay, you're up next. Lynn, un, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, we were talking in our breakout group about the distinction between energy and essence. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little more. Mm. The distinction. Right. So the way I understand it is in theological terms, there's two different Holes, if you will. There's the God is transcendent and God is imminent. And that it has more to do with our own capacity than it does with, but there's this, this wonderful image to go back to the story of Mount Sinai and Moses on Mount Sinai. 
you really see it there. You see God telling Moses, you can't look at me head on. That's that image of no one can look at God and live, you know, that we hear in some texts, that God's otherness is retained, that there is a distinction between the creator and the created. And that distinction in theological terms is, is main, maintained. And that's what we mean by God's transcendent. But God is other. And at the same time, God is imminent. So you have on one hand, no one can see God and live. Then on the other hand, you have the um, Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Well, how can they see God if they can't, you know? So there's a tension in our own tradition between the transcendence of God and the imminence of God and the way that the Orthodox Church, that that rich tradition has framed that has been in terms of essence and energy. That you have God's essence on one hand that is other than us, it is unfathomable, what that means is saying that it's to put it in through our own lens that our rational minds cannot contain it, cannot grasp it. So it, it has just as much to do with our own limitedness. And on the other hand, we're invited to fully participate in the life of God. And of course, that's where our practice comes into play, you know, uh, Centering prayer, all of these wonderful traditions is that we, the way we know God is not through our rational mind, but it's by that image of letting the mind sink, fall, go into the heart. It's through the heart that we actually know God. And that's, that's a, a crucial piece to have of it. So maybe that helps some to kind of unpack that and you see how all of those themes fit. Let's see, K. One of the gems that we had in our group was the thought to see the light, see the light in other people. Mm -hmm. And I just love that thought. And how hard is that? Because I'm thinking of at least three or four people right now who I don't want to think that that's possible. I have my list and it's growing by the second. It's growing right now. I've added two, two more on that list, but that's the challenge of our practice and of what that wisdom tells us is that no one is exempt from this. We don't have the right to exempt people from sharing in God's light. Our work is to, to manage ourselves, if you will, our own practice, that connection between our own mind and our own heart and our own em embodiment, and to live out of that posture so that we can respond to someone else and recognize or seek to affirm in them. But boy, it's hard. Yep. It is. Anyone else? Let's see. Marjorie and then uh, Maribel. In our group, we talked about uh, light and, and we talked about energy. And I talked about how centering prayer is like plugging into that energy. And, yes. uh, and it, it gives me that energy. It sort of gives me something for the rest of the time until my next meditation, you know. And uh, it, uh, somebody else showed a beautiful icon that she copied uh, from an old icon. And I really wish Claudia, if she doesn't mind, to show the group. It's just amazing. It's Angel Gabriel with uh, a representation in the angel's hands of what she's saying to Mary. Would you uh, show it, Claudia?
this little Jesus there. Oh, that's wonderful. Enrobed in light. Yeah. Oh, how wonderful. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah. Want so to talk about it, Claudia? Can, yeah. But oh, Claudia, you're muted. Okay, I'm unmuted now. I'll go to gallery view. Maybe that'll be uh, help me a little bit. Okay, so this was the very first official icon writing I did under the direction of a Greek Orthodox priest. Can't remember the name of the monastery now, but he was teaching here in the in Atlanta. And I've always loved iconography, but I had never seen this particular depiction of Gabriel with the intention, you know, just the baby Jesus there in the bubble. So kind of like in the mind of God yeah. before, before she went, or he went to um, Mary. But um, it's yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. This is a print and, I and they're available. <laughs> If you want one, I'll Good send deal. you one. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. I'm sure. Oh, thank you for sharing. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you for. Oh my gosh. Wanting me to. Yeah. Maribel, I hope I'm saying your name right. <laughs> yes. Or you can say Maribel. You know how it <laughs> how it sounds easier to do it. Well, it, my question is, you know, coming from a person that just started century prayer and where uh, all this mysticism, uh, it looks so, so high, so, so difficult to understand and so um, difficult to, to grasp, you know, and I, I usually it helps me a lot to be more practical. And my, my question is, how to help myself or ourselves to live this energy and to identify it and to 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 pass it on in a practical way you know mm -hmm. you know i understand century prayer is going to help me to get more in uh, within but um, what, what kind of what kind of other things I can do to help myself. Oh, thank you for that. I can only answer for my for myself. Mm -hmm. But what what that makes me think of is this. In terms of my own practice, and I bet we get into this when we come back from lunch as well. When we look at how you know, for me, like I said, um, Buddhism has helped open up the way I understand my own practice, and it gets to what you've just asked around: What does this practically look like? Mm -hmm. And for me, it boils down to this. And I think about how to, to the point of how we just engage with other people. If I can notice myself, what my primary orientation is, which is to say, if I meet someone or something comes up, if I can be mindful of my own self to say, am I angry? Am I suspicious? Or am I loving? Am I curious? And if I can pay attention on that level of how I'm actually engaging with the person who's sitting in front of me, mm -hmm. then that's, that's, uh, that's a very important thing for me to do, mm -hmm. you know, with people who I meet and people in my parish. And I think that's such a challenge right now in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's such a challenge. We, the, the, the world around us seems to be programmed that everyone encounters everyone else with anger, suspicion, fear, and even hatred. And I think what, what our practices do, and this is connected, but what the spirit is doing is on this level of around light, how we embody the light, how others embody the light, and how we recognize that. Practically for me, how that is fleshed out is to say, I have to be aware of myself. Mm -hmm. And then once I'm aware of myself, if I can be honest with myself and actually wonder, why is it that I am so angry? Mm -hmm. Why is it that I 
want to lash out at this person? You know, what, how can I approach this another way? What do I need to ask? Um, I think that's very, very important work to do right now. And I think it is exactly what these practices offer us is a lens that we can do that deeper transformative, that the spirit does that within us and we open ourselves up so that just on a day-to-day -day level, when we're standing in the coffee line, you know, last week I was, uh, I was in my car and got hit by a truck. A truck ran into the back of my car. And that's a moment. And for me, I have to be very aware. When I jump out of my car, I have on a clerical collar. So if I jump out of my car, you know, screaming and cussing and throwing stuff, then this person's encounter, so to speak, of the church, a clergy person, whatever you want to do, how are they going to encounter me? So I was, you know, I'm always aware of that. Maybe we all should wear those collars. <laughs> Maybe that would solve a lot of problems if everyone wore one. Mm -hmm. But so, I, yeah, I hope that gets to what you're saying, because I think it's yes. very important. Just, yes. you know, how do you live day to day? Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Yes, as you mentioned, um transforming and we hear that a lot in christianity and being spiritually transformed how would that look different or would it look different if we were to consider ourselves being transfigured mm. someone else asked me that a dear friend who's a monk at mepkin abbey asked if i would put those as interchangeably i think i would put them as inter interchangeably i think I think they're pointing at the same thing that the of what the, the work that the spirit is doing. That it's a matter of transform. I think maybe transfiguration is the how we yeah. our our entire lives, how we're living our lives and being transformed has to do with our heart. Maybe we could come at it that way and say our hearts are transformed so that our lives are transfigured. You know, but I think they're both in the same, they're both right there doing the same work. They're 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 talking about the same thing. What about you? Is it possible that you could be transfigured permanently, but we're always trying to transform ourselves? Hmm. Mm -hmm. say say a little bit more about what you're thinking i'm thinking the transfigure transfiguration is an awareness that that light is within you uh -huh. and it's always there so once you have it you have it but your transformation more your behavioral side of it i guess to to actually be able to step out of the car and not react oh that's beautiful because you know what that makes me think of julie is in theological terms our methodist brothers and sisters i think would be able to speak to this more of what does sanctification look like in terms of theological terms that we're justified we have a justification and sanctification so I think that what, what you raised really is another way that that image connects with how we understand our own Christian practice. And I am Methodist, so that may be why. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> there you go. See, we need that language because if I think, you know, having that language of our, of our heart being sanctified, being transformed, it challenges all of us not to become so staid and rigid in our religious framework, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, definitely. Oh my gosh, thank you, Julie. You're welcome. Is there one more or do we want to take a lunch break? David, I saw your hand. 
just very quickly uh, uh, to follow up on, on these last two. Uh, number one, Stuart, I, I don't wear a clerical collar. Um, my wife has a tremendous number of bumper stickers on the back of her car. And, and that's also kind of when you're driving that car, it's kind of a motivation about how you drive and, and that how you yeah. act. I think she, I wanted to get her one that said, Lord, please help me to be the person my bumper stickers say that I am. That's right. uh, um, and, and with regard to, to transformation, and practicalities that Maribel and Julie were asking about. A couple of years ago, I did an online course called Centering Prayer as a Way of Life that Contemplative Outreach uh, put forward. And it was oriented toward that, how do we bring the fruits of this prayer practice into everyday life? Mm -hmm. I'll put a link to that in the chat at some point in case anybody else would be interested. Oh, that's wonderful, David. Thank you. Well, my friends, I hope some seeds have been planted and thank you for your willingness and sharing your own thoughts and weaving these threads and because it really does position us for after lunch when we come back. We'll look at, um, we'll just keep digging deeper. We're gonna look and I'll weave in some uh, Tibetan frameworks and put alongside this that for me has opened up um, a more powerful way and a more challenging way to really to really look at what the wisdom of this icon and teaching has for us. So thank you, Maggie.